Good morning. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our e-learning session. My name is Dwayne Henderson, a member of Pre-Lighting's Training and Education Team and host of our e-learning series. For those watching live, happy Friday. Quickly about the session, once we begin, we'll have roughly 15 minutes of content. Our presenter will be available for Q&A at the end of the presentation. And although the participants, participants are muted, we do encourage you all to use either the chat box or the Q&A box to submit questions. Please feel free to submit those during the presentation and we'll answer those at the end. Uh, today we'll begin our first part of a two-part series on Flickr and TLA. And to uh, walk us through that, I'd like to welcome back John Volers. Good morning, John. Good morning, Dwayne. Hey, John, before we get started, can you quickly remind the audience about your role in the business? Sure. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Wallers. I'm the technical manager here at Cree Lighting. Uh, I'm mainly focused on qualification and photometry. Perfect. All right, well, let's get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about Flickr and temporal light artifacts and, and really just cover the basics. Um, so today, uh, it, as Dwayne mentioned, it's part one of two. So today we're going to cover the basics, and in two weeks we're going to cover, cover a little bit more in depth and a little bit more application level. But for today, my goal is, is to just talk about, you know, define what Flickr and TLA are, uh, some of the basic causes of of those uh, phenomena, and then some of the metrics that are out there, and you know, I see a little bit of graphing, where you know, just to expose you to what you might see on some data or from some you know from our Cree lighting information or other manufacturers as well. So today. <laughs> Flickr uh, TLA defined. Uh, Flickr is sometimes referred to as shimmer or flutter. Uh, Flickr is a modulation of light over a time period, uh, so a frequency. So not necessarily an event where you know you might dim your lights. It's something where it's happening again and again, uh, quite quickly. Um, and that's important to understand that frequency because basically Flickr is really the uh, physiological response, the physical response humans have to flicker is between zero to 80 hertz so it for everybody's recollection 80 hertz just means 80 times per second so hertz is per second so that means that you have to have it it's it's happening fast but not extremely fast where the human eye would really pick it up so that's what's really considered flicker and then as the events get faster some things can happen called stroboscopic effect that you pick up is this optical illusion. Uh, you can see over on the left that that ruler is being waved and you kind of capture multiple images of it. And that's due to that intermittent illumination or modulation of light over that frequency. And then there's something called phantom array where your the observer's eye is actually moving and called catching multiple images at varying locations and you can see an example of that here where you see this light streaming but you know you know that light is actually not present there at that time and those happen uh, really from 80 to about 2000 hertz so 2000 times per second it's modulating so it's important to understand how light actually does uh, affect us at different frequencies a little bit uh, differently and what we can pick up as humans uh, but as a whole category, this is all temporal light artifacts, so time-based light artifacts, so some type of modulation in light uh, and time. So some of the traditional causes of flicker, uh, just kind of understand that really flicker has been with us since we ever an artificial light source has been created. It's candle forward, you know, really since the dawn of lighting. Uh, you can see a couple different technologies here, and they all have some level of flicker present. It's just whether or not it's a visible or b even if it is visible is it bothersome uh you know a candle flame flickering or a firelight might actually feel quite inviting so you know thinking about electric lighting uh one of the causes of flicker is really just the nature of ac electricity ac is alternating current so you can see here this is an alternating current waveform going up and down up and down and in north america uh that frequency that ac is operated at is 60 hertz so with a 60 hertz cycle the ac power actually hits zero or crosses zero 120 times per second so pretty fast but that tells you something that you're actually going to zero current zero voltage at a point 120 times per second. 
So one of the nice things, and we're going to give incandescent a little bit of kudos here. One of the nice things about that technology, even though it's effectively, you know, you're warming up a filament and making a heater bulb, but one of the nice things is that temperature of that filament doesn't drop that much. Uh, you know, it doesn't go to zero, right? It doesn't go to room temperature uh, right away. So there's something called persistence. So it's that warm afterglow. And that hot filament just, you know, doesn't change that much during those zero points. So therefore, it was very imperceptible, uh, that flicker that, that a, a incandescent product would have. Fluorescent tubes, which is really just vaporizing that uh, filament uh, in a gas form, and that has a similar effect. It's not as, uh, you know, it's not as persistent as an ink standard incandescent, but it still has a relatively high persistence. So it tolerates some of the zero voltage a, a little bit more uh, readily. Now getting into today's lighting technology, which is solid state lighting. The nature of solid state lighting is that it's extremely fast operating. So it effectively has no persistence. Uh, so there's no afterglow, there's no heated element, there's no excited gases. Uh, you know, and there's really nothing to bridge that, bridge that zero gap. So LED effectively goes complete, completely dark at that zero point. So therefore, you need to compensate for that with your driver. Um, and the other thing is, is the waveform coming in, any of the electricity, electricity variations uh, that are coming in from the, the line, uh, you know, so your AC noise or other things operating in the line could affect your LED driver system and cause it to fluctuate. The other common thing that I think people have probably come across is when you take an LED system or, or lamp and hook it up with a an older analog driver or maybe even an older 0 to 10 volt system, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily play nicely together and those signals might interfere or, or cause some noise that creates a flickering event that you can visibly see. So it's super important to understand that, you know, solid state lighting is a different system and has different needs. And, you know, having a good driver, quality driver that takes care of those for your particular applications is really important. So I'm going to re-emphasize that, you know, protect your LEDs with a good driver. Uh, there is a cost effect to that. So as you get lower and lower cost, drivers probably have less and less capability in them or maybe less performance and be able to take care of some of these TLAs. So if your application uh, has flicker concerns or really you feel that there's it's, it's something that needs to be taken care of and play well, in your space, uh, paying a little bit more for a little bit more better driver is probably a, a good idea. So now that we've seen some of the causes and some of the nature of what Flickr and TLA are, um, what are some of the metrics out there that we can measure and evaluate one product to another? So understanding what's being measured, how, depends on who's looking. So each group down below here in this blue box has slightly different methodology to test the product as well as evaluate the product for Flickr and TLA. So it's important to understand, you know, who we're talking to, what agency or what product uh, might be going in that space and, uh, you know, which metric we're, we're discussing. So if you look at California Energy Commission, um, that's probably the, one of the more important ones, mainly because California is actually the only state and regulation out there that has any control on Flickr and TLA uh, for products, for lighting products. So it's important to understand, certainly as a manufacturer, but also as, as an, anyone repping our product or installing product in California, uh, it's really critical. Now, this is a basically a percent flicker, which is percent modulation, so how much it goes up and down. But it uh, it's a little bit exclusively developed method where they digitally filter it. So they can really just look at and they clean it up and only look at the portions that are uh, from 0 to 200 hertz. So everything has to be less than 30% from 0 to 200 hertz. So it's a little bit above the human visibility range, maybe in that stroboscopic range it's expecting a certain level of performance uh, where humans would pick it up the most. So that's where it's kind of coming from. 
Uh, and then Energy Star has actually been requesting Flickr data for quite a long time um, for solid state lighting and, and compact fluorescence and so forth. Um, so they require percent Flickr, Flickr index, which takes into account both the amplitude and the shape of the wave. Uh, and then there's the LRC assist method or an MP metric. Um, that's more recent addition, and that has is percent flicker, but it's weighted. So humans uh, really see flicker in a, more adeptly, probably between about 5 to 35, 40 hertz. So in a certain range, we see it much more easily. So what the LRC assist method does is it weights that area as more important. And so therefore, if you have any artifacts in that area, any flicker in that area, uh, you're kind of penalized for it because humans will pick it up. The important thing to understand, though, is Energy Star, even though it collects all this data, does not have any requirement that, you know, if you're bad, it doesn't stop you from being Energy Star rated, you know, as long as you meet the other requirements. So there's no requirements in there that limit it, you know, or stop a product from being listed. It's just data collection at this point. And then there's a more recent method uh, methodology called NEMA 77, uh, which, you know, obviously NEMA is an industry uh, group, and they've, you know, lighting manufacturers put together their best effort of saying, hey, this is what we think uh, makes sense. So NEMA 77 2017, it uses PST, which is based on the IEEE 1453 document, and then a stroboscopic visibility metric. Uh, so it looks at, the PST looks at similar to that assist metric, it looks at that human response, that flicker area, and weighs it, like it creates a weighted metric. So those two metrics are actually very, very similar. And then stroboscopic uh, or SVM looks at the little bit higher frequency and gauges whether you're going to have some of those stroboscopic or f uh, phantom array type effects. So NEMA, again, does not put out any requirements. It really puts a test method uh, together and uh, metrics together as their recommended practice. They do recommend, though, that the PST should be less than or equal to one to be uh, relatively, you know, less than half the people see it or possibly see it. And then the SVM of less than 1.6, and that's mainly for an indoor environment uh, as something that would be kind of good and ideal uh, for, for depending on your application. Now, the important thing to understand is all these metrics have their own little quirks, their, mach their uh, data rates that they want, and all these kind of things. And you can, as a lab, as we have at Cree Lighting, we do one test uh, or one series of tests and capture all these metrics at one time. Um, but the nice thing is, is IES has finally released just this month uh, ANSI IES LM9020. And that's a, a measuring luminous flux waveforms. It's a process or a procedure that I think over time all will be adapted in these situations and be required. So you'll get a little bit more uh, fundamental confidence that each lab, you know, each manufacturer, each lab that's out there, third party lab, are testing it in a similar manner so that the data can be compared one product to another. So I think this is a good, good thing in the future here coming. Now, one of the oldest standards that's out there that deals with solid state lighting and flicker is the IEEE 1789. And, and when I say old, it's, you know, 2015, it's not that old. Um, but uh, so this create, took older technology and understanding what our experience is with lighting and set some limits. Um, so it didn't do any weighted metrics. It didn't do any visibility metrics similar to the assist or the PST, but what it did do is took older technology where it was and then outlined where they believed uh, different flicker rates would be acceptable. So you can see here some examples of the low risk region and, and the green area is the no effect. They're not concerned about flicker in this area or TLA in this area. And then that orange region is kind of low risk. So it's still realistically no problem, but you know, maybe a little bit more risk depending on your application. Uh, some examples here are at 120 hertz, you have this blue cross here. Uh, it's allowed about 10% flicker. So you can see 10% modulation of your overall light. So 1,000 lumens would be 100 lumens fluctuation. Um, so that is acceptable and for the low-risk region. 
uh, for a product. And then as you see, as you go up to about 1250 hertz um, or higher, you could actually have 100% flicker. So you could be going up and down significantly, because, but because it's going so fast, it's flickering 1250 times a second, your eye cannot pick it up. Human physiology can't pick it up. We're not gonna see stroboscopic effects. Those things are all kind of out of play. Now, when we start talking about machines and lasers and videotape, uh, those type of things, uh, digital processes that could have problems, we'll talk about that in two weeks in the application event. But you know, from a human physiology standpoint, we really see no issue. So this is one of the things, this chart in particular for me personally, I found this as a way, it's a, it's a bit of an eye chart and I apologize, but if you start to digest it, it really helps you understand where uh, 1789 came from and then where your product might fall or a product you're trying to sell might be falling on compared to older technologies, as well as kind of what risk statement do we think we have with Flickr or TLA. Uh, basically, if you see here, this incandescent line is actually above and below the low risk line. And so you could see that incandescent, which really had no problems, you know, for, for the most part in almost all applications where Flickr wasn't an issue, even though it has some present, um, you can see that it's actually above and below this. So in general, the industry and manufacturers in particular believe that this shows that the 1789 low risk and no risk area, no effect area are really conservative, which isn't a bad place to start. But you can see here these newer metrics, this PST line, which is weighted again, as I mentioned, it changes over time or over frequency, excuse me, um, due to human response to that type of flicker. So it's human would pick up less than 1% flicker you know, in that 10 hertz, 5 to 35 range, but it would be harder to see close as it gets closer to zero, you know, as your one hertz, one time a second, it wouldn't bother you. Wouldn't, you wouldn't really pick it up, per se. Uh, and then same, as it gets faster, you start to not pick it up as much. And then it also gives the SVM curve here, which, again, you're seeing this white area. There's a lot. This is means that the IE, uh, IEEE 1789 is, is kind of conservative. Uh, so it's it's expecting that you really wouldn't get a lot of stroboscopic effect even up to this point. So you can see here where all these older technologies, the magnetic ballasts were where we actually did pick up some issues back in the 70s and 80s and, and you know, fluorescence went to electronic ballasts. So that's where a lot of this came from. Uh, but when you start to overlay the solid state data, this is really helpful to understand where we were to know where we're going. So it's super important in that regard. Um, so I recommend getting comfortable with this chart because I believe you're going to see it more and more uh, when you're starting to look at the data for any particular product. So I know we covered a lot of items. This was, you know, I say basic, but this is a this is a tough topic. So don't feel like you had to digest everything. You know, the Flickr and TLA basics is 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 not really basic. <laughs> so my key takeaways for you is, you know, Flickr and TLA is important, certainly can affect your application. And it ha there is something from all artificial lighting, just to, its severity is different. So understanding that any electric lighting is, is probably going to have this to some extent. It's just trying to control it. Solid state lighting absolutely can achieve good Flickr and TLA control but there may be a cost performance trade-off. As you get less expensive, you might be more susceptible to line interference, interference on a, with a dimmer, and or on, conversely, at, if you want high levels of performance in an area, you may have to pay a little bit more for that you know, really good driver to help your solid state lighting out. And then the other big thing is metrics are out there. Ask your manufacturer, ask your, uh, you know, ask Cree Lighting for that data and drive the request and start understanding it a little bit more for each product so you can help your our customers your customers or evaluate product to product and really uh drive a little bit better performance in your application all right thank you perfect thanks john uh we do have a, a couple questions here um and one i don't know if it's we can answer this week or look to next week but one asked about um the use of high-speed cameras 
a thousand plus frames per second and testing football helmet safety and using like a linear LED high base solution for for something like that. And then you're just requesting information. Is that something that we'd be able to help with? Or what do you think LED in terms of, of, of a typical product for, for that type of requirement? So, yeah, so for, I, I think that's a, you know, a linear high bay, you know, I think there's a lot of flavors out there, right? So there's definitely a lower cost version. Um, and then that you get into higher performance version that can take higher temperatures and, and certainly cost more. The driver is one of the huge components of that. So, uh, you know, I have seen a range of data from lower cost products uh, providing, you know, depending on how they dim, um, they might be pulse width modulation dimming and they get a lot of artifacts, especially at a thousand hertz or above. And that's one of the issues with PWM dimming is it's really not really like very good for high speed cameras for, you know, maybe red lasers on scanners. Uh, certainly all when you start talking about ultra high definition television, the frame rate is 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 extremely high. Um, and I'll go into it more in two weeks, but there's been a lot of uh, or there's been studies on ultra high definition and trying to see where that percent amplitude or percent flicker, what is acceptable all the way out through up to 10,000 hertz. So, yeah. yeah. So we can cover that a little bit more uh, next week. Uh, so, yep. Joe, we're going to get you back for, for next week uh, as well. But I think testing, two weeks from now, two weeks from now. And, and 10 testing systems too, and, 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 you know, where that's a possibility of, of you know, doing some real world testing. Yeah, John, I was going to ask you, you, you talked a little bit about Energy Star and they're asking for information on it. They're not not really using it today. And, and, and for us, right, that's down lights and lamps primarily, it's, which isn't uh, the bulk of the products that, that, that we're offering. We didn't see anything from, from DLC. Can you comment on what they're doing and what's likely to come in terms of, of uh, how we look at this from their st standpoint? Sure. Uh, what I'd say is, you know, hopefully the, the, the pain you felt trying to understand this is, is kind of a similar pain DLC has felt the last couple of years. They really did want to implement um, in the most recent uh, technical revision update, which was earlier this year for version 5 and version 5.1. They really wanted to implement um, a, a flicker and temporal light artifact metric or metrics. Uh, but the pushback was extremely high. There's, you know, there's not a one size fits all. And like, as we mentioned earlier, your cost structure, your application might absolutely, you know, not care about TLA. It's, it's going low cost only. It's not, you know, maybe it's very little used. Like, you, you know, I think you and I were talking about a janitor's closet, yeah. uh, but versus a, you know, a high speed manufacturing robotic floor, lots of rotating parts, uh, lots of workers moving in and out, lots of visibility requirements, task requirements. I think you want to go a little bit higher cost. You want to you want to drive a little bit of more performance in that product. Um, that'd be where I'd, I'd kind of lie on that. So, so DLC, unfortunately, because they really cover the gamut from, you know, the, the, as long as you hit that performance level, they cover the gamut of price and cost and application. So it, they just couldn't come to an uh, agreement with the manufacturers as well as their own staff on what that level should be. So they declined to add that requirement in the most recent. I would say that, especially with the IES document being released, the LM90, uh, so that procedure could get a little bit more stable across lab to lab. Uh, I would guess that maybe in about a three, no more than five years, that type of Flickr TLA will be added to the DLC, um, but but it's not there right now. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You, you talked about no no persistence from from an LED, so we start out where there could be problems, but I think you've made clear that investing in better driver technology and even from a dimmer standpoint, having an appropriate dimmer open source that you're you're trying to control can can up all of this or, or a large chunk of this go away, correct? Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, probably the most common application where flicker uh, and solid state lighting happen is that dimmer uh, compatibility. Um, so, you know, looking at 
what's being installed from a control standpoint in your application or when you're maybe specking out a control application, you know, your application, uh, understanding the compatibility charts that almost all manufacturers have with dimmers and the products that you're going to identify are really important. Uh, if you don't go in eyes open that there could be an issue, you know, just selecting or, or possibly replacing late in the game, you, you didn't check. And now these, these two products have an interference issue and, and you're visibly seeing it. Um, so those are things that, that had been known for a little while. And so those type of complications are, are you know, hopefully can be avoided, avoided. A lot of manufacturers do have that information. Um, but, you know, demoing is always a good thing too. like actually taking the products you're going to, you know, get samples, put it in a room, use the control devices together, make sure that they play nicely in the, in the sandbox. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, for this group and selling products, we've all had to compete against, you know, low price products. I think understanding this at some level, especially as, as we track next week, the applications where you're working on applications where performance is, is valued, um, you know, make certain that customers understand the risks of, of maybe compromising the, the product in, in terms of jumping for, for lower cost solutions. So so with that, John, why don't we move to the next slide and we'll, we'll close up shop. I do want to thank John again for his time and his presentation. I also want to thank uh, the audience for joining us. Um, as John mentioned, in, in two weeks, we'll have part two and we will take a look at Flickr and TLA at the application level. So, so starting to understand um, the importance of this at, at varying types of applications. Um, this content is always being recorded. So on YouTube, our channel, you can find any content uh, as well as we've started adding this to Spotify if you prefer to, to listen to it. So with that, again, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, enjoy your weekends.